Yep. Everything's working. Well, it's absolutely fantastic to be here. I, I, I don't know if I can really call this an interview since I know Tom yeah. so very well. Uh, but I, I, mean, I have no idea who he is. <laughs> I mean, I, one of the things is like when we've been travelling, the story that we tell each other mm -hmm. is we, we talk about how we've been burned by contracts and agents and what's the worst ever gig that we've ever had. But yeah. I think I think we'll we'll try and put that behind us because yeah. I mean that's more amusing than yeah. informative. Right. And I mean, I'm, I know that you're fiercely proud of where you are right now yeah. with, with your music and the, the things that you've been doing and yeah. like how long you've been established as, as like one of the leading lights of uh, the folk scene. What I want to ask is, how did you actually start playing music? Um, well, I, didn't, I don't think of it so much as a start. I was more or less pushed, pushed into the baths, really, if you like, because um, <laughs> my parents sang and played and uh, there was music in the pub mm -hmm. in Newcastle, so everybody sang. Um, when you went out shopping with your mum, people sang in the street, uh, half past three, drunks sang at bus stops. And so, <laughs> so that was it. And, and we used to listen, I mean there was no TV, so but we had uh, the radio and um, music where you work was on, BBC Late Orchestra would be on, and I'd hear violins and I just thought, oh, I love them. Because my mum and dad were piano and accordion. They both played each, you know. So, um, I just, and were they Irish? My dad was originally from Ireland, yeah. And um, but I mean, he spent most of his time in England. You know, he came across the Teesside when he was a bairn, really well, a bit older than that, and then went up to uh, Newcastle after the war. You know. Um, but we had obviously a lot of Irish people in the family and and Scots people. You know, a mixture, typical Teesside. Person really, <laughs> a, lot of, a, lot of, a lot of mixed, yeah, Geordies and Irish and Scots. So there was a lot of music in the pub, and uh, and I was sent to school um, to learn the violin when I was about six, seven years old, and it was a uh, half an hour a week, you know, and that that was great. I had a violin teacher called Miss Oliver, and she was lovely, and then went into secondary school, and that was fiddle again every week but we had a teacher who wasn't interested in teaching bless him uh, he was just interested in being a musician really so and because it was 20 minutes a week i didn't really get a lot of technique or tuition and stuff like that i mean it's mainly been down to me what i've learned and i mean when i let i got through my grades you know but i don't know how i did that but um there was always um like irish music going about and scottish music uh, music hall, lots of songs, stuff like that in the pub, you know. And um, so anything I've ever really learned on the fiddle has been down to me. I mean, you know, it, in those days it's the same as it is now. You need a lot of money to send somebody in for for top tuition. So, it's, so it's basically just self-taught? Really, yeah. I mean, I was in the, new, the Northumbrian Schools Orchestra and all that, you know, and they wanted to, me to be a classical musician as well. But, you know, uh, I... There was a teacher on the TV, um, I think it was Maxim Bengroff's teacher, once said, um, I think if you don't get most of the tuition in by the time you're 10 or 12, then you, you, for classical music, you, you're really and, and things have changed a lot since then as well, I mean, with yeah. the Yamaha method. and So you see these, uh, like, children who are barely as tall as the piano stool. Oh, that's right, yeah. 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 Was it was it only was it only the violin? Because I mean, you've told me two hilarious tales. <laughs> well, I used to try and play the. I mean, you know, I was old enough to stand. I used to have a go on the piano, <laughs> and I used to make little tunes up on the piano, and and, and I tried the guitar as well. You know, three or four chords. All right. Badly, but um, not very good. You did tell me once about the harmonica. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, and I loved the harmonica. I got it off uh, for Christmas off my uncle Harry. Uh, and I always got good presents of Uncle Harry, and it was a bandmaster. It was really, oh, yeah. it was bigger than me, yeah. and uh, and I loved that because I could make up tunes, so blow, so blow, and uh, and and I loved it, yeah. Mm. And um, I used to take it all over the place, and yeah, it was it was great. I, I mean, I tried the recorder at school, but I just had a really cheap. <laughs> Didn't <recorder>. everybody? <laughs> and I had a really cheap recorder, and I was asked to leave the recorder orchestra because I wasn't very good <laughs> but I had a cheap Woolworths one you know yeah. and they all had um, desk camp ones and posh ones you know mm. they all looked like they were they were poor poor faced when they were playing I thought oh, I didn't fancy this all right <laughs> okay so really I, I mean 
it, it's like a lot of dedication has, has brought you to where you are right now, this, yeah. this kind of application and dedication. You, yeah, yeah. Well, I still play about four hours a day. I've just done three hours mm. upstairs there. Um, it's just, I just have to do it really. Mm. It's, it's, um, sometimes you don't always want to do it, but um, it's a sort of um, an, a complete obsession and addiction, I suppose. Really. Yeah. yeah, well, you don't, you don't get to be recognised as a, as a violin player as you have. Just by purely by accident. Yeah. How how did you feel when you were you were given the Radio Two Musician of the Year award? Um. Well, the overwhelming feeling was surprise and embarrassment, really. <laughs> so modest. No, not at all. Because, you know, when you when you're as much into the fiddle as I am, you know, I, I watch and listen to uh, the world's greatest players. You watch them, you know, and they really are amazing people. Mm. And I mean, I'm not being modest about it, but you know, you always, you, I think the best thing about this job is to know where you stand and, and on, on the ladder, if you like, of your own ability. Then you don't fall off mm. stuff, you know. <laughs> I, I like the idea that you're saying, like, of your own ability, because mm. there can be competitiveness between oh, musicians who are, let's say, like, I'm the best guitarist or I'm the best flute player. Yeah. But yeah. if you if you recognise how good you yeah. can be yeah. and how you're striving towards that, that that's. Yeah. I think that's right, Tony. I mean, you know, um, you'll never go far wrong if you um, if you keep an eye on what you're doing yourself. And there are people better, there are people not as good. It really, it's not important. I think it's 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 why you're doing it, and and the joy of doing it. But you have to um, get the best out of yourself, and that's that's the only thing. The competition thing. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter. People can compete. People can just be the best. If there's loads of fiddle players come along to me and say we're better than you, I say, of course you are. <laughs> Good luck. You know. Yeah, I know. Well, it, it seems to the idea of playing music is for enjoyment, mm -hmm. not not as a kind of a gladiatorial no. like fight, fight right. with somebody else. That's right. I mean, you know, the um, the thing is. There's, there's all that that's to do with, with your own head, and a lot of it's fear. A lot of musicians are brought up by, by fear, you know. Uh, they're fearful of this, that, and the other. And usually it, it can come through teaching, it can come through people telling them that they are the best, which is always a mistake. Then when they find out they're not the best, it's hard to cope with. Um, there's all that fear attached to that. But basically it's about yourself. Um, knowing what you can do, but then when you go out to play for people, it's about the people. And it's about getting them to enjoy or, or making sure they're happy. Mm -hmm. And one of the one of the dismissive comments I've had from people up in my area is that I'm an I'm an what is it a crowd pleaser. Mm -hmm. That was meant to be derogatory in the old days because but, you were. But playing. I would say that was a compliment. Well, I see it as a compliment now. Yeah. But it wasn't meant to be. You know, it was like right. you play tunes that everybody knows. And, uh -huh. You know, you're supposed to play tunes that nobody knows. All oh, right. So okay. therefore, you're going to be better. A better musician. Right, because you're, you're more obscure than That's right, yeah. and the and people won't know it. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's not logical anyway, you know. No. Um, and it's, you know, so really it's, it's, it's the power of the music and, and what the music means rather than what you think you know and what you do. Yes, it's, it's your internal want yeah. Yeah. That, that, that drives you forward because yeah. you always seem to be striving to mm -hmm. something improve on your own excellence, which, oh, is, which is a great thing. Well, I've got to. You've got to keep. You've got to keep doing the best you can because it's. If you've decided that this is your life, you've just got to get on with it. Mm. <laughs> I, I mm. suppose in the same way as like to get to, to sort of to be a virtuoso on the violin doesn't come by accident, and to actually perform yeah. doesn't come by accident. I mean, no. I, I mean we met. Uh, properly met at the Rosa Trilly Festival, didn't we? Was That's it right. 1974? 74, it, yeah. it would have been, yes. Uh, and um, but uh, we'd met before. Yeah. In the place, not not 250 yards away from here, yeah. the the Turks Head. Turks Head, yeah. That's right. Because there was a Sunday session, and I came in and I thought, who was that playing in a in a, a fantastic way? Mm -hmm. I mean, the clarity and the strength and the force and mm -hmm. the the passion that was with it. Yeah. Uh, and um, but when we went at the Rosa Trilly Festival, yeah. we actually got to know each other better. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and we kind of said, you know, what are you doing? Come, yeah. come to Leeds, yeah. which is where we were all based. Yes. 
Yes. Yeah, so yeah. so we kind of dragged you down to the <laughs> It didn't take much dragging, really. I'd, um, I'd trained as a, uh, as a chemist, a very poor one, really, and I'd just left, I'd left work, um, 1972-ish, and um, 73. I just decided I wanted to play the fiddle. I had no idea where to go, what to do. Mm. And then, so you gave me a direction. Yeah, you know, but it's funny, isn't it? Because, um, it, like, we met, met with you and... You know this the passion that you obviously have mm -hmm. you know we didn't realize you know we said oh come down to Leeds and then mm -hmm. I think you turned up about three or four <laughs> days later after we'd come back because <laughs> I've got to say the Rosa Trulli festival was a very strange um, sort of like beast in those days yeah it was yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but we had such a great time and would yeah. feel an affinity with you yeah yeah I mean it was uh, it was funny we were in the Southwest of Ireland and everything around us was Irish, but there was this. Geordie <laughs> on There was this Geordie. <laughs> we might as well have been in South Shields and Newcastle. Yeah. So, <laughs> and we so, play like that, don't we? We play like we're from here. Well, we, we, you know, well, that's how you developed your own style. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, if, if you had to try and play like somebody else and slavishly follow their, mm -hmm. their, their kind of way, then yeah. you, you wouldn't have that originality. I, I, I mean, um, we told you to come to Leeds and then kind of you were just brought into all of the things that we were doing. Mm -hmm. You know, there were lots of bar bands and yeah. uh, wine bars at that time. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think I invited myself really. Oh, not at all. <laughs> more, but no, it was, it was really good fun. And, um, you know, then you discover, um, surprise, surprise, what people are and what they like. You know, there was the ones that loved the music. There was the ones that were very opinionated. That, but you couldn't play that music correctly because you weren't, you know, weren't doing the right things, and that, there's so many opinions going on. Mm. And um, when in reality, yeah. at that time, seventy three, seventy four, nobody really knew. No, no, they, they were they were making their own judgment and saying you can't with no credibility. Yeah. Yes, I think there was quite a. I think today things have, have completely turned around because. There was a sort of a reluctance in those days to um, to say you shouldn't really be doing this, you know. And, yeah. and there was people were reluctant to let you be a professional musician. You, you know, you can't be serious wanting to do yeah. this. Whereas now, young people are encouraged yes. to go out. But there was a, there was a kind of a negative thing. I always call it the working men's club syndrome, um, where. You had all these guys would come in on a Sunday morning behind their papers and they would load the paper, you knew you were doing well if they load the paper. <laughs> but basically they'd been working hard all the week mm -hmm. and the musician, it wasn't a proper job. So you know what I well, mean? Well yes, yeah. No, I mean I still that I still believe that's true, that people don't that's really right. see being a musician as a as a career or as a job. It's, it's yeah. something that somebody on the telly does. Yeah. Yeah. Or somebody a lot better than us does it, you know? Do you know what I mean? Or maybe it's just that they, they don't know you. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, yeah. It has to be some, you know, the prophet not being received in their own yeah. home or, yeah. or whatever that, that quote is. Yeah. Um, so if you packed in work in 73 because you wanted to play the violin, that was a huge step. I mean, yeah. in, at that time, you had like a job as a metallurgist. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you said, like, I'm going to stop. Yeah. You know, uh, th that was like a huge step. That was... Yeah. How, did, how did your family react to that? Oh, they, they were horrified. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> my dad oh, said, you played that bad? <laughs> my dad said, what are you going to do when you're 40, you know, and, uh, and stuff oh, like funny. this. And, um, but that was the thing in those days, you see. We come from an area of depression and poverty, really. And, um, I mean, we, we had a good life growing up, but, I mean, we never showed a food or anything. But... It was like when jobs are scarce and you, you manage to get a job, then you should hold on to it, you know, that yes. kind of thing. Um, but I mean, I had no choice, I just had to do it. <clears throat> it was a huge adventure and it wasn't difficult at all, mm. even though it was <laughs> probably the most difficult way I could have done it. But because mm. there was no, I had no money, there was no telephones, there was no gigs. <laughs> Was, yeah, but, you know, but if you think about it, that's that's like the spur that that kept you going. Uh -huh, yeah. I mean, we had this, um, like the bread and butter uh, of doing uh, maybe the odd Cayley, yeah. and there'd be wine bars, there'd be like Bistro Five, there'd be Grobs, yeah. there'd be the ones down in Call Lane yeah. at the bottom end. And the you, four clubs that we would do. Uh, and four clubs, yeah, but but I mean, that, that's the thing, I mean, we had absolutely no idea what we were doing. It was, no, no. But, but, 
one of the greatest things was that there was the um, the regent, yeah. where there were all these old oh, players who yeah. were probably about our age that, yeah. that seemed older than God. Yeah, yeah. You know, all of yeah. the Paddy McNicholases and yeah. the rest of them who worked on the building trades, yes. or at least played yeah. in the canteen at dinner time and yes. kept everybody's spirit up, yeah. thinking about old Ireland. And we'll, we learn from them. Oh, fantastic, yeah. I mean, and their the, the sons and daughters, I mean, you know, they were all fantastic. So it was the real, real island and Leeds, you know, and it was, it was completely different to the way that, that I'd learned to play in Newcastle. Mm -hmm. You know, even though I knew Irish, I've heard Irish music and everything, but to actually go in, into, like, a community where it was a specific style that we're all mm -hmm. playing in was, was just <laughs> tremendous. Foxford. Yeah. Oxford and me, got, it, it was as if everybody, had sort of, in the same way as we found ourselves in Tralee, mm -hmm. they all found themselves in Leeds. That's right. And there was such a breadth of players as well, there were oh. players and violin players, and, yeah. uh, yeah. and so the All Island champions. Yeah, fantastic. It, it, was, was, it was great to, yeah. and actually, and they were so nice to us because we didn't play the way they played. <laughs> no. And no. they were quite. Um, raucous at times, you know, and there was always, I mean, you couldn't, all you had to do was sit down on that little stage and your feet were covered with pints. Yes. Everywhere. I used to call it the magic stool. <laughs> you know. That's right. Yeah. Well, well, in the Regent, there was like a stage, probably, I mean, it seemed massive at the time, but it was probably maybe about eight foot wide, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. probably about sort of ten foot long, that's mm -hmm. kind of jutted into the room. Mm -hmm. And the established players would all be on, yes. uh, sitting on the stools there, and they got free beer. And we, at first, we had to sit at, at the side. sides, right. and we'd play. Yeah, but yeah. but like I say, once once you become established, I, I mean, I'd, I I know we're talking about you, but my experience no, of it was that um, I played the mandolin at first, yes. and you could play everything because yeah. nobody could hear you. <laughs> so you got used to moving your fingers and getting the odd note here and there. Yeah. And then when I moved on to banjo, when you could hear it, yeah. it, you know, it was like, oh, right, I really don't know these tunes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And we must have seemed like wild peacocks. I think you know, so. Like, yeah. hey, down to here, yeah. and like yeah. Afghan coats and flares and yeah. scoop neck t-shirts and, <laughs> you know, it, it, you know, like playing Irish music, yeah. like some kind of rare breed of... Yeah. It human was, being that they've never seen. Yeah, that's right, yeah. I mean, it was amazing, like, you know. But, the, I mean, what stuck with me, as, as has all through me, like, is that they were enjoying themselves, you know. There was no, there's no, like, there wasn't any, well, who's really important here? Who's got the most gigs? Who's uh, going to be on 412? Or who's going to be on that festival or that? It was a way of life, and you meet this when you go all over the place, but, I mean, one of the places I went to was Shetland, where you got the most staggeringly good players in the world, as you do in Ireland, but the Shetlanders are Shetlanders, and they all, you know, um, they all carpenters or work in the oil industry or whatever, yes. and they, they never come out of Shetland, and yet you'll hear such fantastic music. So it's a great lesson, like, you know, so mm. to accompany the music of my life and, and of our lives, you know, goes along with this thing, well, you've got to make a living with it as well. Because you've decided that that mm. was how you were the best way to survive playing all the time is, yeah. just, is to do gigs. I'm not always sure whether that was right or not, but it's just meant that I've been able to spend more time playing. Mm. You know, but it's definitely um, I had to learn it from people like Mick Elliott and all the people we grew up with who mm. were doing gigs before us, watching them how to do a gig. Mm. Whereas um, I mean, we knew absolutely nothing. No, we didn't know how to do so, gigs. So we did what any. Same person would do, we stole. And we just copied. Yeah. 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 Copied. And then you'd have friendly um, artists who would advise you and tell you, and help mm. you, you know, like Elliot, Mick Elliot was, was a really good friend. Was, you should wind up sleeping on our couch and, yeah. on a, a very regular basis. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I mean, the, the, the last thing I'd, I want to say about the, about the lead scene was it, it was a huge melting pot yeah. as well. I mean, the, you had all of the, the singer-songwriters yeah. who were, were established. There was like the well-established um, singers as well and yeah. quite a number of folk clubs. I mean, the Grove oh, and the Adelphi and lots of the it. Memphis. And, and then you went through, you had Wakefield and Huddersfield and yes. all the places and then you went across to Manchester where you had. So, yeah, uh, yeah, I remember um, the American um, banjo player, um, he moved to 
to America, um, an Irish guy, I can't quite remember his name, but anyway, I told him when I was in America that I was living in Leeds area, he says, oh, he used to gig there, he spent two weeks in, just in Leeds, mm. in the surround, you know, doing yeah. gigs. So. I, I mean, I personally feel very lucky that we had uh, a great grounding, I yeah. mean, we we'll wound up having to serve an apprenticeship. Yeah. To learn how to play, That's right. uh, and like floor spots could be anything. Three and four songs was quite yeah. regular. Yes, quite a regular thing. So, yeah, and I think the people um, well, were lucky to be in Yorkshire because everybody was really good to us. Really. Mm -hmm. The people of Yorkshire people were really welcoming. You know, mm -hmm. It was a great place to be. It was easier for us coming from Townside to live in Yorkshire. Mm -hmm. I mean, you knew because you were there first, but then for us, say, if I'd moved down. Um, nothing against the other places, but if I'd moved down to London, I wouldn't have felt that same, that same warmth of support mm. being down there, you know, I'm yeah. sure I would have made I'm sure you would have, it, it, it just, it seemed to be, there was like a well-established, it, it was far enough away from home, yeah. you know, so that you had your own life, yeah. but close enough to home if anything disastrous ever happened, you could get back. You could always get yeah. back. Because I remember when I first moved down, I was hitching back up here every weekend. Yes, you know, well. Thinking I was something special, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm a full-time musician now, you know. Yeah. I've hitched, hitched yeah. all the way home, you know. <laughs> so, you know, that's something that I haven't, uh, I'd forgotten about, but you, we used to hitch to gigs. Yeah, that's right. So if, if, you had, if you're living in Leeds, and you had one, say, in Leon C, which would be, you know, at best, like a four-hour hitch, a four-hour four drive. Hour, yeah, at least, yeah. 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 So you would set off at six o'clock in the morning yes. to get there for eight o'clock at night. Yes. You would triple the amount of time it would take yeah. in actual terms. Yeah. And it, it just seemed so precarious. Mm, it was, yeah. And yeah. I remember, you know, if I, if I was in a duo, like Bob, Bob, Bob Fox or something, with, with, you know, he would hitch down the leads and then we say, right, well, we're going, we're going to Birmingham, okay, you set off first. So we'd go to the mm. junction of the M62. Right. And he'd stand there and I'd go and go away. All right. right. And then he'd get a lift. And if somebody was kind, he said, oh, bring your mate. Right. So usually he'd just get off and then I'd come and hitch. Okay, so was this the beginning of your solo career? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, We'd like to say it's supposed to be Tom, Tom O'Connell and Bob Fox, but only Bob's made it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, it's, um, I was always... I mean, kind of, so I started playing the fiddle on my own a lot, really, you mm. know, before I met Bob. It was Mick Elliott that got Bob and me together, really. Really? I, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but to preempt that, I mean, you and I formed yeah. a duo. We did, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we, we did stuff together. Yes. And then with um, other people, um, with Bernard. And That's right, yeah, well, there was Burnt Pete. Burnt Pete. Yeah. That you might need to explain how the... How the name came around would take far too long. But th this right. was part of that. Um, I, I mean, we were singing quite popular or populist songs. Mm -hmm. um, like Bernard Davy was singing all of the Mountain Jews and the, you know, Will You Go, Lassie Go. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, and with Paul Long. And yes. I, I mean, it, it was a very vibrant scene as well. And Nick Stroke was around. Was exactly, right? yes. And, yeah. um, you know, like I say, Gordon Tyrrell and Tom Napier and right, yeah. uh, like a lot of people, yeah. you know, would be singing. Um, they're going to put me in the movies. Yeah. That yeah. couldn't be something that the, the yeah. Beatles did. Yeah. We had no shame whatsoever. <laughs> I've, I've still, I've, I've still got a cassette uh, from me and you playing at the White Swan in Eden. All right. It, it sounds like it's recorded on cellar tape, but oh, I mean, I've, right. I've still got it. And that was a lovely club. That was Stephen Rosie. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That was great. I suppose one of the things, in line with the tradition of, as it used to be, say, in the 19th century, there wouldn't be that many instruments within a village, so it would be quite usual for a violinist to sing yes. and sort of carry the tradition of that area at the same yeah. time. Oh, yes. Do, do you feel that you've um, taken on that mantle sometimes? Um. I think it was out of necessity, really, originally, because I was in a duo with Bob Fox, and um, Bob decided he didn't want to do it anymore, and we had gigs. Mm -hmm. So rather than lose the gigs, I thought, well, I'm going to have to sing, because I never sang with Bob. All right. So um, I just, I was down in Cornwall at the time, and Vic Leg, you know, the great singer, um, I said, uh, I said, what do you think of me singing and playing the fiddle? He says, well, 
have a shot, sing something for me, and of course it's really quite poor at all, you know. He says, oh, that'll do, get on with it. Like, <laughs> and and it, was, it was the best advice, really, you know. And then I had to, to learn, well, basically I had to learn about song, really. I mean, I always sang for fun. Mm -hmm. But to, um, and then there was the mechanics of fitting in the fiddle with the voice, which took a long time to, to sort out, really. You know? mm. But I did it the wrong way around, like I was trying to do both together. You know, but really, it should have been just singing a song, letting the song stand up on its own, and having a tiny bit of accompaniment. And um, I mean, one of the, my biggest, um, I've never sort of followed or copied anything that Barry Dransfield did, but he's a fabulous singer and player of the fiddle, you know, one of my favourite ones. And I mean, these days you've got really clever people like Nancy Kerr, who is, for my mind, just about the best at playing the fiddle and singing, you know, with uh, mechanically and, and artistically and all the rest. She's fab fabulous, you know. Um, so you've got, like, <laughs> my early beginnings, really bad, to you've got a really high standard. Now, <laughs> but you still don't get that many people doing it, and I think it's because it's... I think it's just a bit awkward, really. You've got to fit your voice in with the fiddle. I mean, Barry told me to lower the... Um, you know, the pitch of the fiddle, to make it easier to sing with. Mm -hmm. That was one thing I did for a, a good while. Um, just physical things like that, voice and fiddle together, you know. And then when you play the fiddle, you play tunes all the time. Mm -hmm. So then you have to get into learning about chords and what works and what doesn't. And that's a whole different mm -hmm. structure, really. But, but you've stuck with it. Oh, uh, yeah. That, that, yeah. That's, that's the yeah. thing. I mean, oh, yeah. there, there's never been a point in time when you've said, like, I, I can't, I can't do this. So. No, no. And I think when people hear me, they definitely say, oh, that's him. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good thing. I but it's I've a marvellous thing, my dear. I've got my own thing now. And yes. My own style. That I, and this, I think this goes back to what we were talking about earlier on. I think the longer you've done it and the longer you live, you realise um, you just better get comfortable or it's not worth it. Mm. So comfort is the thing now. So uh, like, you know, whether we were together in Doncaster or or here at the festival and you see lots of other people. Um, you just really want to make it a joyous occasion rather than, you know, posturing or, or, or not being or being uncomfortable. I mean, you know, it's just we're lucky to be there really, mm -hmm. to be playing. Oh yes. And having, yes. and having the fun, you know. I, I do I, I do think we're very privileged to to be allowed to to perform. Yeah. Uh, in this way. I mean yeah. it's just it, it's just very strange that, you know, we had no idea at the very beginning that we were going to be like performers. It was yeah. it was more the love love of the music. And it well, was interesting true. what you were yeah. saying, yeah. that now there's almost like a career path yeah. that people can see. Exactly. But, but strange that the career path um, is, is, is now doesn't involve as many folk clubs. No. Because, because there's been quite a, a drastic... Yeah. Reduction, reduction in in, them, yeah. in the number of four clubs, yeah. and yet there's a a lot of lot of performers. Yeah, well, I still think that um, I mean I like um, to play as quite acoustically as much as I can. I'm not against microphones or amplification because you need them, but um, I still think if you get a really good room, four club room or whatever, it's still a great place to play. You know, oh, yes. there's something very impersonal about a huge stage monitors and all the rest and then your audience is out there yeah yeah i feel like often in that city which i'm in a vacuum really all right you know i mean i enjoy it but of course you do but it's um unless you get uh somebody doing the sound who really understands what you're trying to do mm -hmm. then it's hard work it can be hard work yeah. but it can also be a, a joyous oh a joyous yeah. occasion yes oh my god yeah. yeah it's good fun you know it is it's the best of fun I've got to say that, like your um, versatility in the in the styles that you play. I mean, one thing I haven't mentioned is you don't just play, say, in an Irish style. You have, you, you can play like Scottish tunes, and mm -hmm. you, you take on the um, the characteristics uh, yeah. of the, the different styles of music yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and that that also adds to your your solo booking. Yeah. Well, I think um, I think it's basically it's rhythm, it's understanding rhythm, you know. And getting back to what we were saying about the Irish centre, one that um, in Leeds, um, the um, the Regent pub, one of the things that first struck me when I, I 
and they actually asked me to sit on the stage and play with them was how <laughs> simple the music sounded. Mm -hmm. It sounds it it only two notes and that tune, not three yeah. notes, you know. Yeah. It was simple. Yeah. And I thought, but this is not simple because I, I, I'm not doing it like the way they're doing it. And mm. the lift, and, and of course, what we're talking about is rhythm. Mm. So I think anything that you tackle, um, I mean, I'm very fond of bluegrass, but I'm, um, and I've, you know, I've played with bluegrass players in America and stuff like that. But I, I find that it, um, it's a lot of. Um, short notes and it's quite flat mm -hmm. and it's drum all the way through. It's fantastic playing, I mean, it's a wonderful style. But it's not really my style. I like to have space and a lot more lift mm -hmm. in it and, you know, paint pictures with it really. Yeah. Um, and one thing, uh, I mean, that, that you are noted for is that, I mean, you can play the tunes really exactly to the, the tune, but you like to improvise around them as well. Yeah, yeah. Which is a great thing. Yeah. And I think there should be more of it because this yeah. idea of it's like a runaway train mm -hmm. and it has to go like that. Yeah. I mean, the old players you know, would, would quite often, yeah. you know, just, just wander away from the tune and play what they felt like, yeah. which fitted in. And what I, I want to emphasise is that what you do does fit in with the tune, <laughs> but, but like improvising around it, yeah. you know, and adding a little lift and a, yeah. a, a, a bit more... Um, you know, improvisational skills, yeah. which which is what you've yeah. which is well, what you've gathered over the years. Well, I, I it's um well, I mean, I heard a fiddle player um, from Dublin called Tommy Potts, who was um just played like that all the time, you know, and I thought that was lovely. But I remember when Maguire came, Sean Maguire, and he would he would up and stuff, and it wasn't so much that he changed all the tunes around; it was the excitement, and then before you knew where you were. He was playing a different version of stuff, and I thought, oh, you really don't have to stick to the text. Mm -hmm. But um, what hit me straight in the eye was, uh, rhythmically, it was spot on. Oh, yes. So obviously, um, I, and of course, when I first started trying to copy some of these things, I was all over the shop, and the rhythm would suffer, you know, I thought, well, this is wrong, this is really wrong. Mm -hmm. So I spent a long time um, keeping the rhythm right. I would often play reels like hornpipes, you know, if I got the songs, mm -hmm. like when... Patrick and Andrew up in um, Tyneside who used to play uh, the Knights, the yes. wonderful chaps. Um, they used to love me going because I used to play like reels in the hornpipe style. Right. And that was only through sitting in our house down mm. in Leeds and, and working out rhythmically what's going on here. Mm. And I, I knew fine well that there was the complete difference. Yes. You know. But your perseverance and your willingness to experiment yeah. has, has brought yeah. you to where you are. Yeah, like yeah, right now. So I mean, I'm trying at the moment to, to understand, um, which is a lot more difficult, um, like jazz violin. You know, the um, the chords, structures, mm -hmm. the all that system, and that's let's say going back to school again, mm -hmm. which I'm not um, equipped for. But I'm basically I can sit and mess around and, and mm -hmm. learn learn um, little bits and pieces of stuff, and, yeah. and adjust the tunes. I mean, there was a jazz player once at me. Says, Says you play great in your style. <laughs> <laughs> in my own style. Yeah. Yes. But you see the whole thing, it, it comes back to what we were talking about before. It really doesn't matter that I'm not Stem Grappelli and I mm. never will be, or um Tim Cliphouse from um, Holland or whoever it might be, all these fabulous jazz players. And Tom McConville from Scotswood Road, who likes to play a bit of jazz, you know. But that's uh, but and that's that's, that's surely the, the best thing that that you, you, that you can be who you are and you're not trying to be somebody else. Then you're comfortable then. You yes. And nobody can come along and say, well, you know, you're trying to do something you're not. No, I say, I'm not. I'm Tom McConville, you know. Yes. I, I mean, a, a similar, <laughs> similar aspect is when I first started songwriting, I thought, oh, I'll never write a song like Joni Mitchell or, yes. or like John Strong or whatever. Yes. And the day that I realised that I would never be able to write one like them because I'm not those people. Yes. Uh, and you write in the, in the style that you, yeah. that you find your your own, yes. you know, and, and being comfortable with that. Right. I always think that, uh, when I've seen you perform, mm -hmm. that you've got the best of all worlds, because I, I've seen, uh, like, some, say, people who would, um, who would play only comedy songs, uh, and then they'll the wind up, say, like, 20 years into the career, they go, like, Everybody just expects me to be funny. Yeah. But you've always had quite a mixture of a material yeah. where you've had like the saddest and most heartfelt songs and tunes, mm -hmm. but you've also been able to introduce um, a, light, a light touch to that as yeah. well. Yeah. 
Well, was that like a deliberate choice or was it just that no, I just certain thought, songs appealed to you? Yeah, I think, well, it's, I mean, I love all sorts of um, songs and music. I think being connected with singer-songwriters has been really useful. Uh, Realising that um, you had to really uh, add something to the song, accompany the song, rather than what you thought should be in it. So, like, reading the text was very, very important. And then people would say, oh, well, you do that really well, you know, how do you do that? And you say, well, you stay out the way mm -hmm. as much as possible and just put in a few notes um, that you think might lift the song and or is, is relevant to the song. Um, so there's that. I, I think a lot of it is to do with performing uh, when you're doing a gig and it's reading the audience, you see. And, I mean, you, you, have to, you have to do your music without... Um, you know, slavishly, slavishly following exactly what you think people want, but you've got to be so aware of the atmosphere in the room and, and how they are. Because you can feel straight away, can't you, when they're not happy. Mm. <laughs> and so you can, it's peaks and troughs, you mm. know, and take people up, take them down. Yeah. And, um, and uh, you know, I would say I'm not a traditional singer. I don't know what a traditional singer is. I love traditional music. I try and respect it as much as possible. Um, so a good song is a good song, and you can. I think you can only do your music with the tools you've got. Once you're trying to sing like uh, one of the most amazing traditional singers, or uh, Carthy or whoever, once you try doing that, then you're not yourself. So mm -hmm. you have to be put it forward in what you are. You know? So stay true to yourself, and uh, it becomes much easier. Yeah, yeah. But the, but that's the, that, that's a great thing because. If you have these light and shade moments, then it takes takes the audience with you. Yes. Uh, and you've you've given them some sort of highs and lows. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like Macbeth isn't funny, yeah. but it's entertaining. Yeah. You know, yeah. so you so you don't have to do so you can like raise and raise a yeah. lot. Well, that, that's that's a great thing. I mean, in many respects, I, I think a lot of people see you almost like a, a triple threat. I mean, you're in, a musician, you're a singer, you're a composer. Mm -hmm. uh, and you have like all of these different, literally like strings to your bow, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. and, and that's only through longevity and being conscious of yeah. making sure that it's entertaining. Yeah. Uh, and and I, I do sometimes think on the folk scene people misunderstand what entertaining is. Yes. You know, entertaining can be, you can read a, a very um, sad book and be entertained by it. Yes. So, so. Yeah. I remember going to Shetland to do a gig and um, I didn't have a very good gig. Um, I love Shetland, I love the people. But um, I was, there was stacks of people came, including Willie Hunter, the great Willie Hunter, they all came to see me. And it was like, it felt like a real judgment, you know, because they weren't really that, um, I mean, they weren't really that sort of communicative or that friendly, really. And I mean, which is not true about Shetland. Shetland are so friendly, they're wonderful people. But I remember Willie Hunter coming up to me and saying, uh, where's your uh, piano player, your guitar player? I says, I don't have one. Oh, he says, you're an entertainer. Right. You know, and, and of course I was, I felt a bit um, humiliated by that comment, but really um, it, it was exactly true what he said. Whether he meant it like, well, I'm not going to be as good on the fiddle because I don't have a, mm. a piano player or whatever. It, I wouldn't like to say it. Mm. he was a nice man, but um, but I did take that um, probably the wrong way. Yes, I am an entertainer, you know, and mm. I'm playing the same. But that's not a bad thing. No, it's not. It's a good thing. It's a fantastic thing. <coughs> and I mean, that was the difference. Willie Hunter stayed in the Shetlands, and he was a genius on the fiddle, but he that's where he stayed. Mm. But he would have been completely uncomfortable in the places we've been mm. trying to do gigs. Oh yes. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Unless it was in the rarefied atmosphere of this is something from a certain heritage yeah, which has been transported yeah. to you for yeah. for this evening and, 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 and nothing more. And I think people in his own way, was, was, uh, Willie was so lucky because he was such an amazing player, but he was just really comfortable doing that. Mm -hmm. but because he could go and do that all the time and nobody ever said, nobody ever judged him. Right, yes. Like that. Whereas I do feel we do get put under the microscope a lot on the scene. Mm. Now it's a lot easier because we've been around a lot longer mm. and now we don't really 
It doesn't matter that much yeah. what people say, as no. long as you're doing the job right. Isn't that the best thing about getting older? You can just say whatever you like. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, yeah. And people have to take it. That's right, yeah. Well, uh, you, you've, you've spoken about trying to accompany uh, mm. other people. Mm. Um, I mean, you were in Holland for, for quite a while, so mm. like, hanging around with, as I mentioned, John Strong and okay. Kieran Halpin yeah. as well. Yeah. Did you find helping them, uh, and with Bob Fox, of course, uh -huh. um, accompanying them with song helped you with your own singing? Very much so, and um, in fact it was Kieran and, and John that encouraged me to sing a lot more really. Because you know, I never, when I first started singing I thought, oh this is bloody awful, this, you know, who wants to listen to this? Until, uh, I, mechanically I started to learn how the voice in the fiddle really worked. Then I started to enjoy it at a much later time. But before that it was basically to make a living. But Kieran was always very encouraging. and. Um, and I just learned a lot about about chord structures, about songs through so listening listening to them all the time. You know, I, I loved I loved that period. You know, of of and it was basically the strongest thing about it was um, the accompaniment, the song, and the accompaniment of our gig. I mean, we used to play some tunes and that, but it was always the songs that I think was the strength of the duo, really. Yeah. You know? But then um, after that. You move away and you become more yourself, you know. Uh, but it takes a long time. <laughs> it does take a long time. It yeah. does take a long time. Yeah. I mean, you have been associated with quite a lot of bands as well as yeah. in, in duos. And yeah. I think, I think it was Magna Carta. It was yes. was that the first? I mean, that that was quite a, a well known band at that yeah. time. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, I don't think I was ever officially in it. I was. I did it. <laughs> I think I invite like all of me. I invited myself along. And um, they were really nice to me. I mean, I was. Um, I, w I did a little tour of Norway as a guest. And uh, I suppose we got on that well. They said I was. Uh, yes, yeah. I went along solo, you know. Right. And, and is that where you um, wound up with the, the, the live album? Yes. Yeah, that was. I mean, but there was a tour. It was a great experience because I was playing with. Um, it's, uh, lots of different people, um, the different influences, you know. But they had this gig, this tour in Holland of fifty-five gigs in six weeks. So <laughs> sometimes three gigs a day, and in the middle of it all, we did an album in at the Greek Hall in Norway, and they hired a um, transporter an aeroplane and went up and did it, come back in the middle of this tour, and that was. I suppose the biggest experience I've ever had of being in a very organised tour um, in, a, in, a, in a place where there was pop music. I mean, they had chart hits, you know, in the in Holland. In Holland <laughs> and in Spain. They were, they were big in Holland and Spain, yeah. yes. And Norway. Oh, and Norway. Okay. So, um, and then, um, because, you know, they, they, did, they did do extremely well, you know. Um, so, they had all these really wonderful gigs in big places and it was great fun All right. and uh, but it taught me a lot about myself you know, um, how to do 55 gigs in six weeks <laughs> and get on with with other people yes you know, yeah. and, uh, and I won't ask whether you got to the point where I don't like the way you breathe <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's all that you know. yeah. but it was a great experience um, one of the toughest experiences I ever had with bands was with Dab Han when we went to America and um, we got a tour it was a 10 week tour from Los Angeles, we drove, well we flew to Los Angeles and we drove all the way up to Canada, back down right through Idaho, the Rockies, all the way to Mexico and then back to Los Angeles and that was 13,000 miles mm. gigging all the way. We weren't prepared for it, mm -hmm. you know. I thought I thought I knew all oh, gigs. Well, yes, when you when you're in Europe, I mean Europe's, like the distances can be yeah. two, three hundred kilometres but in America, it's three times that. Ah, oh, hours and hours on and in, in, in the van, and um, also we had no communication. We had no phones. We had no. We just we had a map. Mm. Uh, <laughs> we had uh, we had no idea about merchandise or how we were going to make any money. We carried our own PA, and it was a bit of a slog. Uh, but I think it was a psychological thing of not being able to enjoy it because everything was so difficult for us, you know. Mm. Whereas now, if anybody goes, any young people go now, they know 
how much money they're going to make roughly, they, mm. they've got everything costed, they've got communication. Yes. You know? <laughs> so, so it was like I a mean, Wild even, West really. Yeah. <laughs> even, even go to Hull where they had different coloured uh, telephone boxes uh, and you had to go from that exchange yeah. to another one, so phone and home. Yeah. You know, it was, was almost yeah. impossible. I mean, yeah. there's been a big shift in that, that amount of, yeah. like, global. I mean, you did also with Dab Hand, you toured in New Zealand? Um, no, not with Dab Hand. I did New Zealand with Paul and Cable. Oh, of course, um, yes. But we did um, Europe a bit, you know, Italy and um, Germany and, uh, and Holland with Dab Hand. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's funny. I think it can be a very lonely place uh, on the road with other musicians. and. When there was no communication at all, it was a bit like um, being out in the Wild West because it was just a public telephone and you didn't phone home. So you mm. were quite secluded, really. Yeah. And then three oh, yeah. years sleeping in a motel room yeah. together, you know. And, yeah. uh, so. and if you did phone home, it would be four and a half tons of shrapnel. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And then when if you put the receiver down, it just sounded like this cas like the, the Tuckney Falls. In, That's right. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, so you recorded, but I mean, you played on many people's, many other people's albums. Yes. Yeah. But but you've you've recorded quite a number of albums on your own now. I mm -hmm. mean, there was the the Tommy on like Tommy the on Road song, series, yeah, yeah, uh, the Tommy on the Road and those kind of things. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Um, I think I think the Tommy thing came, and then the solo albums came um, when I'd left that band, really. Um, and got together with Chris Newman, who was my producer uh, and um, advisor and accompanist, and um, he, he produced the albums. And again, gave me the confidence to um, sing on my own and say, "Look, you know, th this this is relevant here." And it was then, I suppose, about then I started to really enjoy singing and thought, "Well, I can. That doesn't sound so bad. That now." I'll carry on with the singing and all that. But it, it made me quite um, a solo artist, independent. I mean, from the early 90s onwards. Um, I mean, I've always, always sang on my own, played on my own. But from then, it was a career move. And it was I had a lot of work just with me and the fiddle going around, you know, in the early 90s through. I still, obviously, still do my solos as well. But it was then, like, I established myself as a solo, mm -hmm. you know. Because there was still a lot of that... Um, well, where's your guitar player, and um, you can't do this with just a fiddle. It's strange, isn't it? That yeah. that that it was a real <coughs> living part of the of the tradition. You know, like mm. this, like the violin player singing at the same time, mm -hmm. and people going, "But you, you need yeah. a guitar." Yeah. With right. this, so where did where did the Tom McConville band fit in with all of this? I mean, um, well, I I just decided that um, you know I've been doing little bit, I had accompanists, um, like for example Sean Lakeman um, from the Lakeman Brothers, when he was studying in Leeds, he was doing a jazz course, I would take him out and play a bit of guitar for mm. us, and then, um, and well, there were a few people that I'd used, you know, Woody and people like that, and um, there are some places where, where you need to have more than one anyway, so that would imply that, uh, I don't really know where the band thing came from really, I just... I knew Shona very well from um, from from locally, you know, being around him. Dave, oh, it was Chris Newman actually. Um, <clears throat> I said I need a guitar player. He said, Dave Newey, um, just phone him up. He's he's one of my pupils. <laughs> and he, we didn't do any practice. He just came on a gig and played. All right. And then from there it built up. Mm -hmm. Shona was at loose end after having um, stopped playing with Damien, mm -hmm. and so I invited her in, and then and then. Cousin, uh, my second cousin, Phil Murray, rang me up. She says, um, "You need a bass player. What are you doing with? You need a bass. You need me." <laughs> so he invited himself. This is a family thing. You just invite yeah. yourselves into band. That's right. That's right. Yeah, and that was how it, it happened. Really, it grew from that, you know. And um, and then um, when I got the award thing, um, it sort of enables you to just say, "Well, look, there's something decent here. Give us a gig." Mm. You know, and then so we, but we've stuck together. Um, I mean, because can I just ask you when? When was the uh, award? Uh two thousand and nine. All right. Yeah. So it was I was in Manchester at the time. All right. I was listening to it on the on the car radio. Oh yeah. And it was absolutely slushing it down with snow. Yeah. So to like when I got back to the day, yeah, <clears> I, I like I sat 
I was sort of like uh, listening to it until it finished, you know. Yeah. Icicle on the end of it all, but so <laughs> yeah. proud. Yeah, so oh, proud of it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was, it was a total surprise. And um, there was a big Geordie faction in Newcastle thing, um, people at, at the back. And they were all shouting when I was when it was announced. You know, it was like it was like a football thing. You know, <laughs> it wasn't so much to do with me. The music was Newcastle. So you know, um, good, good, good fun, really. I think they were all just pleased that somebody from up here got an award, just as much as for me. You know, yeah. I think. And so it was for uh, you, <coughs> for sure. <laughs> Definitely for yeah, you, but, but I mean, you, you've you've made like band albums and you you've toured pretty extensively. I saw you uh, a week ago when you were in Doncaster. Absolutely fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Different yeah. from, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong, but when the Bothy Band came out, ah. that was such a shock. Oh yeah. Because it was a, a rock sensibility oh, fantastic, w yeah. within uh, like folk music, and it yeah. was beautifully produced. Yes. Uh, and then we wound up with four hundred thousand. Um, body band clones. clones, basically. So there's there's a an authenticity that I like with your band. I'm not saying no, no. you know anything anything against anybody else who plays. Oh no. I just love the fact that people get up, but there's an originality and an authenticity with your band mm -hmm. that I really enjoy. Yeah. Is, is that something that you've worked on or? Uh, no, it's probably something that we haven't worked on. <laughs> All right. <laughs> it's um, so it's an instinctual sound. I think so. Yeah. I mean, the players, I mean, Murray's a fantastic bass player and um, a legend, really. And Sean and David are, are, I mean, Sean is an amazing accordion player and David's a great guitar player. And I think um, they instinctively just listen to each other as we play. Mm -hmm. So they've got the common tunes and songs mm -hmm. and we'll just work together. I mean, you know, you probably noticed on the gig, um, I stay out of the way a lot, you know, you get, they get a solo there, solo there, and mm. whatever, you know, and it seems to blend very well. Mm. There's not, the arrangements aren't too heavy, it's just like a, a listening band really, mm. and it seems to work like that very well, you know. Um, I mean, the, the thing these days with a lot of bands is to have rhythm changes and mm. lots of clever improvised mm. bits. Everybody stops and yeah. one, <clears throat> one one musician yeah. plays for a little while and then yeah. everybody piles back in again That's and then right. it just gets louder. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, you know, I think it's quite sort of... Um, well, I think it's a unique sound. I, yeah. I, do, I do... It's one of those things that I can sit and watch the whole show. Yeah. You know, yeah. where sometimes I, I think after the, the fifth one of something played... And it's not about yeah. speed, but it's no. just... Yeah. I, I, we, had that, we had that grounding of playing for dancing. I yes. mean, one thing I haven't mentioned is like the John Doon and Cayley band. Yes, that's right. Which, uh, and well. the fact that um, a lot of the time at the region, that they quite often be uh, a drummer. And that was yeah. it. There was no speed knock. No, I was no. like, that's the way it's got to go yeah. all the way yeah. through. So Yeah, and of course John had perfect rhythm and, uh, you know, a lot to John because, um, I mean, you know, an unsung hero in the area, really. I mean, we all know how how good he was and that, you know, but um, as far as the national awards thing was going, <laughs> he, you know, he deserves a posthumous award, but um, he was just amazing, really, mm -hmm. and uh, the first time, I did a lot of playing with him for the kids, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, Irish, the Irish dancing, yeah, yeah, yeah. and that was the thing, like, you know, you had to, you had to follow John, like, <laughs> drink beer and play music, Yeah. you go what, for what, your... what, the only thing I was missing was girls, <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, yes, yeah. I mean there was nothing more frightening. Uh, I mean Bob Fox wrote down about like how how lucky we were to have played with John Doonan. Mm. I, I mean there, there was the other thing on, on the side of it. There was like when the Irish mummy, you know, was there with her daughter, mm. telling you that you'd played slightly faster, yeah. you know, for her her daughter, and the, like this, the you know you were scared stiff, so yeah. you you had to play yeah, in time right. and exactly. Yeah. And you'd play the same tune for yeah. maybe four hours. That's right. You know, and I remember um, the little girls when they would stand and, and their dress is ready to go. So John would start the tune on dum da da dum 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 or whatever it was, and mm. the little the girl would go up or down. Mm. You know, and he get she'd get it just right, mm. and he'd follow her, mm. and then she'd set off dancing, mm. and then it wouldn't change. Yeah, you know. Oh yeah, brilliant, amazing. You know. Yeah. 
I, I suppose, really, I'd, I'd like to come to a conclusion uh, yeah. at the end. I mean, you've been mm -hmm. cited by like many people as a, as a huge influence on their playing. I mean, Seth Leitman, for a, for a start off. Yeah. Who has been your biggest influence? Um, and I suppose on the fiddle, um, I mean, there's, there are many. Um, I think, you know, um, classically there's, there's, there's a lot of them, Itzhak Perlman and uh, Max and Benglock, but in, in my own field, I suppose, Sean McGuire and Dennis Ryan from Offaly. Or, I mean, McGuire particularly was a huge influence, not because I've tried to copy him, but I just loved the spirit of what he did mm -hmm. and how he, you know, when you and I used to see McGuire, he'd come across and, you know, almost he'd stumble on the stage a little bit, you know, and then the fiddle would come up, he'd straighten up, and as soon as he started playing, everybody, all the audience, <laughs> they went up in the seat. Didn't they? You're making me do it. You know? <laughs> yeah. It was just incredible, really, and he had that spirit mm -hmm. of playing and of course um, Mick Elliott got me a gig with Stephen Grappelli <laughs> not with him but on the same bill and I was just blown away by him so the people like that and of course Willie Hunter from the Shetlands you know mm -hmm. and then you've got young players who I absolutely adore you know like I say younger they're getting on a bit now I think they're 40. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> but the Wrigley's Jennifer Wrigley. You know, oh yes, of course. She's just an incredible player. And of course, the great Gordon Gunn from, um, from Aberdeen. There's so many, really. But um, in actual fact, if a solo person playing the violin and being really comfortable, I would say Johnny Doherty from Donegal. Uh, amazing. Just totally solo all the time. Mm. And then for singing and playing, Barry Dransfield, I guess. Mm -hmm. really, you know, and if you wanted to find out how to do a gig with a fiddle, and you watched Swarbrick, because mm -hmm. he knew how to do a gig. Mm -hmm. He was the premier entertainer on the fiddle. Mm -hmm. You know, as far as that, in his in his heyday, you know. It's great. It's great the fact that you're like such a fan and so knowledgeable, and mm -hmm. you've absorbed all of this to make your own unique style. It's just been such a pleasure. Ah, lovely. Yeah, Thank well, you very much. Oh, no, 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 it's been absolutely fantastic. I enjoyed that. Thank yeah. you, Tony. Well, it's a pleasure. It's a real pleasure. <laughs> great. Lovely. <laughs>